World number no. 1 ranked male tennis players is a year-by-year -year listing of the male tennis players who were at the end of a full calendar year of play at the time generally considered to be the best overall for that entire calendar year. The runner-up for each year is also listed as is a summary of the reasons why both were ranked as such, which includes the performance of the players in major tennis tournaments of the particular year and the tennis ranking authorities which provided rankings. Topic: <laughs> Rankings before 1973. Before the open era of tennis arrived in 1968, rankings for amateur players were generally compiled only for a full year of play. Professional players were ranked by journalists, promoters, and players' associations usually at the end of the year. Even for amateurs, however, there was no single official overall ranking that encompassed the entire world. Instead, nation rankings were done by the National Tennis Association of each country, and world rankings were the preserve of tennis journalists. It was only with the introduction of computerized rankings in the open era that rankings were issued more frequently than once yearly. Even the end-of-year amateur rankings issued by official organizations such as the United States Lawn Tennis Association were based on judgments made by men and women and not on mathematical formulas assigning points for wins or losses. In 1938, for instance, when Don Budge won the Amateur Grand Slam, it was easy to conclude that Budge was not only the U.S. number no. 1 but also the world number no. 1 amateur player. It was far more difficult, however, to decide who was the best overall player, amateur or professional, for that year because both Ellsworth Vines and Fred Perry, now professionals, were still at the top of their form. Two different sources, however, carefully studied the performances of the players for that year and both concluded that Budge was the best overall player, with Vines a close second. For the previous year, 1937, one of these same sources concluded that all three players, Perry, Vines, and Budge, deserve to be called the co-world number one players. In 1946 Bobby Riggs, a professional, had established himself as the best player in the world. In 1947, he was still the best professional player but Jack Kramer as an amateur player won Wimbledon and the U.S. Championships. Kramer, having turned professional in November after the Amateur Pacific Coast Championships, met Riggs three times in late December on fast indoor courts and Riggs won twice. But at the end of their long series of matches in May 1948, Kramer had led Riggs decisively in head-to-head -head meetings. 1948 was the last year in which an amateur player turned professional and then went on to beat the defending professional champion, even here, however, some years present difficulties. Kramer was perhaps the world's best player in 1950 and 1951 when he crushed first Pancho Gonzalez and then Pancho Segura in head-to-head -head tours but was dominated in tournaments by those same players. In 1952, there was no long, headline tour. Instead, there were short tours between different players and several professional tournaments, with the result that none of the professionals played extensively. The short-lived Professional Lawn Tennis Association published an end-of-the-year list in which Segura was ranked the best player in the world, with Gonzalez second. During the year, however, Gonzalez had defeated Segura four matches to one. Segura had also won a number of important tournaments. The following year, 1953, Kramer narrowly defeated the top amateur turned professional, Frank Sedgman, in their tour during the first half of the year and so re established himself as world number one, at least for that period. But then, because of injuries, he did not play the second half of the year. As a result, Kramer was now in semi-retirement. In 1954, there were a number of round robins tournaments as well as shorter tours, from which it is clear that Gonzalez had now established himself as the best player in the world, the first year in a run of seven consecutive years as the world number one. 
but, given the spotty and often contradictory record keeping of the professional results since 1926, it is frequently difficult to make a clear, objective judgment as to who was the best player in any number of years. <laughs> professional tennis in Europe before 1926 There were numerous teaching professionals, that is, players who gave lessons for money at private clubs and public parks. Because they accepted money in return for their services, they were not allowed to participate in amateur tournaments. They did, however, create a number of relatively small professional tournaments for players like themselves, primarily in Europe. Some of the oldest professional matches known are those between Irish player George Kerr and American Tom Pettit. In 1889, Kerr beat Pettit three times in four meetings. In June 1890, Kerr won all three matches against Pettit in Dublin. In April 1898, a professional, round-robin tournament was played in Paris on covered courts. Both Thomas Burke, tutor of the tennis club de Paris, former teacher of Joshua Pym who won Wimbledon twice from Ireland and Kerr, Fitzwilliam Club, defeated Tom Fleming, Queen's Club, and Burke defeated Kerr 6 to 2, 4 to 6, 6 to 1, 5 to 7, 6 to 4. During the 1900 Paris exhibition, a professional tournament was held on clay, with Burke finishing ahead of both Kerr and the Englishman Charles Hirons. In the spring of 1903 in Nice on clay, Reginald Doherty, the leading amateur, defeated the leading professional, Burke, 1–6, 6–1, 6–0, 6–0. Burke was reportedly as good a player as the leading amateurs. Charles Haggart was the best English teaching professional during the early 20th century. In 1913, Haggart settled in the United States, invited by the West Side Tennis Club of Forest Hills, New York and became the coach of the American Davis Cup team. In practice matches, he beat the leading amateurs Anthony Wilding, Wimbledon winner, and Maurice McLaughlin, Wimbledon All Comers winner. In the 1920s, Carol Kozalu, Albert Burke, son of Thomas Burke, and Roman Najuch were probably the most notable, as well as the best, of these players. The Bristol Cup, held at Bewley or at Cannes on the French Riviera and won seven consecutive times by Kozalu, was the world's only significant pro tennis tournament." Kozalu went on to become one of the best of the touring professionals in the 1930s. He and Burke, however, were not listed among the top players before 1928, as this was the first year when a ranking was published for all the top players, amateur and professional. All top ten rankings for the years before 1928 were for amateurs only. The major professional tournaments before 1968 Tradition on the pro circuit was non-existent before 1968 because the event hierarchy could change each year. Some major tournaments, however, stood out at different times. Elite events that lasted only a few years mostly because of financial collapse included Three major tournaments held a certain tradition and usually had the best of the leading players. They were called, "...championship tournaments". The most prestigious of the three was generally the London Indoor Professional Championship. Played between 1934 and 1990 at Wembley Arena in the United Kingdom, the tournament was unofficially and usually considered the world's championship until 1967. The oldest of the three was the United States Professional Championship, usually called the U.S. Pro, played between 1927 and 1999. Between 1954 and 1962 it was played indoors in Cleveland and was called the World Professional Championships. The third major tournament was the French Professional Championship, played between 1934 and 1968, generally at Roland Garros. 
The British and American championships continued into the Open era but devolved to the status of minor tournaments. The winner and runner-up in each of these tournaments will be shown for the years in which they were played. These three tournaments Wembley Pro, French Pro and US Pro through 1967 are sometimes referred to as the professional Grand Slam tournaments by tennis historians. In any particular year, another tournament, such as the Forest Hills Pro or the Masters Pro, could have had a better field. But over the decades, these were the three «majors» that all professional players sought. Discrepancies in source material The occasional lack of authoritative material about the early years of the professional players is an issue that complicates the creation of reliable rankings. For instance, the very existence of the 1936 and 1938 Wembley tournament is in question. Two sources, Collins and Macaulay, give results for the Wembley tournament in each year. Bowers, however, is adamant that neither took place and offers some evidence to support his view. In 1947 Collins said that Riggs beat Budge in a tour, Macaulay said that there was no long tour, only a short one between Riggs and Frank Kovacs. Tom Lecompter says that there was a small tour with Riggs overcoming Budge 12–6 followed by the short Riggs–Kovacs tour 4 to 3, but 11–10 according to Macaulay. Other examples, the French Pro until 1933. Macaulay says that the first year of the French Pro is unknown but begins his list in 1930 whereas Ray Bowers doesn't talk about any French Pro before 1934 even in 1934 he doesn't use the expression, "...French professional championships", but writes a three-day tournament at Roland Garros, September 21–23. For example, in 1933, the supposed Tilden Cachet final 6 2 6 4 6 2 listed by Macaulay was just according to Bowers a singles match with a slightly different score 6 3 6 4 6 2 of a USA France meeting in the Davis Cup format at Roland Garros where Cachet defeated Bruce Barnes, Tilden beat PLAA and Cachet and Barnes overcame PLAA and the US won the doubles. Topic: The world number one and number two rankings. Before 1973, there were no computer-based rankings based on the points players obtained for achieving a certain level of performance in particular tournaments, but only journalists or officials on their personal behalf or promoters or players themselves who listed their own annual rankings. In some years, however, only a small number of journalists or players released rankings at the end of the tennis year. For these years, rankings done by tennis historians or sports statisticians well after the tennis year ended i.e. in the 2000s for a year in the 1960s are considered in the determination of which players are ranked number one and number two. In 1973 the ATP listed its own rankings every fortnight and some years later around 1977 every week but they had many imperfections because in the 70s and the 80s they did not take into account such events as the Davis Cup, the WCT Finals and the Masters later called the Singles Championship and in the 2000s the Tennis Masters Cup. Currently, the ATP does award points for what is now called the ATP Finals. See, List of ATP No. 1 ranked players. As well, the ATP point rankings did not award the Grand Slam tournaments which most often attracted the most top-ranked players in the world Wimbledon and, the US Open and, therefore, were the most valuable to win in the minds of both players and tennis journalists, an amount of points commensurate with their importance. As well, some events which did not attract many or even a couple top-ranked players but offered high prize money were worth a higher number of points than their perceived importance. 
Therefore, other rankings proposed by tennis experts or by the players themselves could be more accurate because they included these events and adjusted the rankings to reflect the actual importance of particular tournaments. From 1973 to 2006 this list sometimes differs from the ATP list because it shows journalists or even players rankings released at the time and not the computer-based point rankings. In particular, Connors has been ranked number one, at the end of the year, from 1974 to 1978 by the ATP, but the majority disagreed with the computer rankings. For instance, in 1975, leading journalists, including John Barrett, Bud Collins, Barry Lodge, and Judith Elian, ranked Arthur Ashe as the number one in the world while his ATP ranking was only fourth. In 1977, no one, except the ATP, ranking, considered that Connors was the best player in the world, and everyone thought that Borg and Villas were the top two tennis players, and in 1978 everyone and, in particular, the ITF recognized that the Swede was the world champion. In 1982 and in 1989, respectively, Connors and Becker, both winners of Wimbledon and the US Open, were considered as world champions even though the ATP ranked McEnroe and Lendl as number one in those years. Since the mid-90s the ATP rankings had been more or less accepted by many as the official rankings but in 1999 many considered Sampras as the second best player in the world while the ATP ranked Kafelnikov second. Finally since 1978 the ITF represented at the beginning by Sedgman, Hode and Trabert has designated his world champion. From 1973 onward, as there is no shortage of rankings that were released by tennis authorities or publications at the end of each tennis year, which reflected the generally agreed upon importance of particular tournaments at the time, later rankings by tennis historians or sports statisticians are not considered in the listing of number one and number two players. Before 1913 very few sources are available but Richard Yallop in Royal South Yarra Lawn Tennis Club 100 years in Australian tennis stated that Norman Brooks was the champion of the world in 1907 and Len and Shelley Richardson in Anthony Wilding A Sporting Life cite the opinions of A. E. Crawley an early 20th century British journalist and Anthony Wilding the New Zealand tennis player. Other years dating back to 1913 also present difficulties and ambiguities. There are sometimes contradictions between sources regarding the same information. <laughs> List of number one and no. Two ranked players <laughs> <laughs> Early tennis era rankings are more variable in nature due to limited sourcing. A. 